Welcome everyone, so glad you are able to join us today. Our vendor partner today is Euclid Chemical Company. For over 30 years, we've been an integral part of the architectural community, and we appreciate our partnership with you. My name is Vicki Strand. I'm the marketing manager for Whitecaps Concrete Restoration and Waterproofing product line. As we integrate with the Whitecap team, we are combining to better serve you. Our mutual commitment to being better together and building trust on every job will continue with the exceptional service and knowledge that you've come to expect. We are in the process of adding another webinar or two to our series, so please continue to check your email for more details. As a reminder, today's presentation is an AIA-approved one-hour, one HSW credit. Today with Euclid Chemical Company, we will learn about concrete moisture resistant treatments for concrete floors, admixture and surface treatments and their effect on moisture resistance, and moisture vapor transmission through concrete floor slabs will be discussed in detail. Before we get started, I would once again like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. We do have everyone muted as to eliminate any noise and distraction and provide a great learning atmosphere. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this in your, on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. When you join today's call, you selected to join by phone or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will also have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter by typing those into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will be collecting these and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce today's presenter from Euclid Chemical, Euclid Chemical Company, excuse me, Matthew Hansen. Matthew Hansen is a graduate of University of Toledo, Ohio. He has more than 35 years as of successful experience in sales, marketing, and technical services within the concrete industry. He has been employed by the Euclid Chemical Company for over 23 years and currently holds the position of National Business Development Manager. Matthew is a member of the American Concrete Institute Committees, ACI 362 Parking Structures, ACI 546 Repair of Concrete, ACI 563, Specifications for Repair of Structural Concrete in Buildings, and the International Concrete Repair Institute Committee's 110 Guide Specifications, 310 Surface Preparation, and 320 Concrete Repair Materials and Methods. Thank you, Matt, for joining us today. Are you ready to begin? I am. Can you hear me? Sure can. All right. Good. Hey, thanks folks, uh, appreciate you attending from your uh, computers. We have no cameras today. Um, so I guess you have to take my word for it that I am fully dressed and not presenting uh, in my pajamas or anything like that. But uh, um, as, as Vicki mentioned, I've been with Euclid for about, uh, about 23, 24 years here. And um, we are a RPM held company. RPM is a very large holding company that's, U, that's a U.S. company. It's traded on the Dow. And they own other brands that you may be familiar with, such as uh, Tremco, Drive It, Stonehard, Carboline, Zinser Primers, uh, Tester model, model Glues, and uh, a whole plethora of, of different uh, chemicals that are used in the, in the uh, construction and the adhesive industry. Um, as such, we have a lot of uh, share technology, and we've been uh, lucky enough to be owned by them since 1985. So uh, it's not uh, we're not one of those companies that's been bought and sold and bought and sold. Uh, we're a company that's been able actually to uh, to experience some very good growth, uh, especially over the time that I've been here. I think when I started with uh, with Euclid, we were probably a uh, $25, $30 million a year company. And uh, this year, our annual sales will probably uh, be over 500 million. 
So uh, we're, we're, we've done very well under this uh, RPM umbrella and expect it to, uh, to continue on. What Euclid does uh, is we manufacture any chemical that's related to concrete. Uh, from concrete admixtures that go in the concrete to, to change the set properties and things like that, to uh, re reinforcements such as fiber reinforcement. We're the largest manufacturer of fiber reinforcement in the country. Uh, concrete repair materials, whether it be epoxy, cementitious mortar, that kind of stuff. Decorative materials such as uh, um, stamped concrete, colored concrete, polished concrete. We get involved in all of that. Uh, decorative coatings, which we'll talk a lot about today about, uh, you know, resinous coatings and so on. And then waterproofing is another uh, big part of our business. We've got plants throughout the U.S. and North America, and uh, probably I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 distributors nationwide, uh, the White Cat Group uh, making up a big part of that. So today we're going to talk about the effects of uh, water on moisture sensitive flooring. We're gonna talk about how water enters concrete, how it leaves concrete, moisture testing that can be done to determine at what rate it's leaving the concrete and how much is in the concrete. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish up with uh, prevention and mitigation of moisture problems in flooring. So the first thing we wanna talk about is, you know, what kind of problems do we see as a result of, uh, of moisture in concrete? Well, certainly we see things with uh, adhesive breakdown, blistering, delamination, mold, buckling and swelling of wood floors, and then you know, moisture damage to, to goods stored on, the, on those floors. And these are just the most common ones. There's certainly uh, other ones out there. So the first thing that I encounter is, uh, or talk about here is adhesive failures. So what's changed? You know, I mean, um, many years ago, we, we didn't have the problems that we're having today with adhesives and compatibility with moisture. And a big part of this came about probably in the mid nineties when the EPA passed a lot of restrictions that changed the way that the adhesives had to be manufactured. They had to take a lot of the solvents out and use more uh, water-based type materials, which led them to be more water soluble. So a lot of times what we have nowadays is uh, adhesives that, that uh, don't do well in the presence of moisture, where in the past it really didn't have as much of an effect on them. So when we glue down carpet, tile, those kind of things, and, and we don't control the moisture coming up out of the concrete or in the concrete, then we can end up with a, a, a breakdown of the adhesive and a failure of, of adhesion. Another thing that happens uh, with a lot of these adhesives is they're not very resistant to high pH levels. And when we're dealing with concrete, particularly wet concrete, uh, the pH levels can get to be fairly significant. And uh, you, know, you get pH of a, of a 12 or so and it starts to break down these adhesives, which leads to, again, um, adhesive failure. Another problem that's very common is uh, mold. And I think probably the, you know, the mold issue has probably been around a very long time. It's just that in the last 20, 30 years, people have become a lot more attuned to it and realizing that the, the mold is very toxic and can create some serious issues. So uh, when we've got moisture trapped or coming up through a floor into things like carpet pads and stuff like that, it's not uncommon to see mold growth and that mold growth uh, can be very, very expensive to abate. When we put down impermeable coatings such as epoxies and urethanes and things like that, it's not uncommon if we've got uh, moisture coming up out of the concrete to get blistering. And this blistering is typically uh, it's osmotic blistering in which we get a, a, a osmotic cell gets created beneath the um, beneath the coating at the at the concrete interface, and it builds up a great de degree of, of pressure. Um, it's it's been tested to show that you know we can get through an osmotic blistering, we can get pressures of upwards of three to four hundred psi, far far exceeding the bond capacity of of most your uh, epoxies and urethane coatings. 
Obviously, uh, wood flooring uh, in most cases is susceptible to swelling uh, in the presence of moisture. And when we see that, we get buckling of uh, things like uh, expensive gym floors and, uh, and that kind of thing. This is the picture I actually just took it in my basement. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a slab on grade. I've got a water table that's uh, probably only, I would say, three or four foot below the, the concrete slab itself. And um, as water is migrating up through the concrete in the form of vapor, if I set a box down on the surface and leave it sit there for any length of time, this is what I get. It's basically a wet spot in the, on the concrete surface. And you know this is had this just happens to be a basement, but I've seen it on warehouse floors as well. And if they're stacking cardboard directly on the floor and they've got moisture coming up in the form of vapor, it's not uncommon to see those boxes be damaged. And when we see that kind of damage, obviously we're losing goods and money and and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of sensitivity out there um, with a lot of the coatings. Uh, for the most part, the typical limits of moisture sensitive flooring are going to be three pounds per thousand square foot of moisture drive or moisture vapor emission rate, referred to as MVE, MVER in a lot of cases, or a uh, relative humidity of approximately 70% in this lab. And we'll talk more as I get into the testing of how we determine uh, what those moisture levels are. But those are probably the two key numbers that, that, that manufacturers that manufacture sensitive flooring, those are the numbers that they're looking for is a, a maximum three pound per thousand square foot in 24 hours of moisture drive or a maximum relative humidity of, of 70%. So ACI 302.2R is an excellent document that covers um, moisture sensitive flooring and the things we can do to concrete to, to help with that. And in there, it's got several tables. And, and one of the tables is one that talks to us about the, the traditional limits on our typical limits for moisture vapor emission rates when we're dealing with floor coverings. Now, I, I would point to the fact that this study was done in 1995. So it's getting to be a little dated. And it actually was done probably based on that time frame, right around the time that the EPA was uh, instituting the regulations that were changing the adhesives. So some of these categories of probably things like vinyl composition tile and, um, and linoleum and things like that uh, have probably moved, dropped down into the three pounds per thousand square foot limit rather than the five pounds per thousand square foot limit. But needless to say, uh, this this document does a good job of, of spelling these things out for us, and uh, we can see here that you know typically we're looking for about three pounds per thousand square foot for 24 hours for for moisture vapor drive. And well, again, we'll, we'll we'll discuss that in detail of how that's measured. They also provide charts on the relative humidity, and this is actually just measuring the humidity level in the concrete itself. So we want to uh, have typically, like I said, today, I see most of my manufacturers out there are calling for 70, 75% relative humidity. It's something that you should actually look at what, whatever their manufacturer's limitations are, and, uh, and that's what you should include in your specifications. Now, um, there are multiple moisture test methods out there that, uh, that I've alluded to. Probably the three most popular ones, starting from the left, is the uh, calcium chloride test. In the middle, we have the relative humidity test. And then on the uh, right is the uh, plastic sheet test. And the, below it shows the ASTMs that govern those. And we'll talk a little bit about each of them. First one I wanna talk about is probably the oldest test um, and probably the uh, the least sophisticated of all the tests, and that's the uh, the poly sheet test. So, in this particular test, what they do is they take a given size of uh, of uh, poly or bisqueen, they prepare the floor, and then they tape this down to the surface 
for a given period of time. And then they come back and they pull the visqueen and they look for evidence of moisture on the underside of the visqueen, whether that be in the form of droplets or dampness in the concrete or something like that. So if you see that, that it's indicating to you that there's moisture. Usually they run about one test per 500 square foot if they're following the ASTM designations. Now, what a lot of people don't realize with this test is in order for moisture to be present on the underside of that poly, you need 13 pounds per thousand square foot for 24 hours of moisture vapor drive. Now, I just told you that the typical limit is three pounds per thousand square foot. So running this test will certainly tell us if there's moisture present, but it's not a sensitive enough test to really be used with a moisture sensitive flooring. And I still see it specified a lot. And I still see some manufacturers that call for it, uh, even though they're, they're, their limit that they're publishing is three pounds per thousand square foot. If you test with this test, you won't be able to determine if it's at five pounds or six pounds per thousand. The only time you can make a determination is when the moisture drive exceeds 13 pounds per thousand square foot. So this test is really not one that's suitable for uh, moisture sensitive flooring like we're talking about today. The chloride test has been around uh, a long time as well. And the way that this test is run is they take a given weight of, uh, of chloride or salt and they put it in a dish and they um, put a plastic dome over the top of it. And that plastic dome is adhered to the surface of the concrete. And then after a given period of time, they come in and they pull that dome and they take that dish out with the chloride and they weigh it again. And the difference in weight tells them how much moisture that chloride has absorbed. And then they can calculate what the moisture drive is based off of that. Um, this test, again, it's an older test. It's on I would say the majority of people's literature, this is where they're getting when they say three pounds per thousand square foot, this is the test that they're running to get that. A couple of things about the test that make it less desirable. Uh, one, it requires very good surface prep. If the surface prep isn't done correctly and that dome isn't adhered correctly, you're not gonna get the test results to be correct. Another reason is, is like, almost much like the visqueen test, uh, both of these tests are, are measuring moisture vapor transmission out of the concrete. And as we get into talking about moisture vapor transmission, you're going you're gonna to find that a good deal of what determines the rate at which moisture is coming through the concrete at is the atmosphere in the room. So I can literally change the results of this test simply by by changing the atmospheric conditions in the room, uh, changing the relative humidity in the room and things like that. So this test, both this test and the, and the visqueen test give us a measure of what the moisture vapor drive is at a given time, but they don't tell us what the moisture vapor drive could potentially be if the atmosphere in the room changes to a point where it causes a moisture vapor drive or results in more of a moisture vapor drive. So this test, I'm thinking most experts say that in 10 years, this test will, will be phased out um, in, in lieu of the relative humidity test. Uh, I, I tend to agree, although I, I, I also, um, I think that probably running both tests together is, is the best way to do it. However, you know, that, that at some point is probably gonna become, uh, not become cost effective, but, so the relative humidity test is done in which they actually drill a hole into the concrete to a particular depth based on the uh, on whether there's a vapor barrier or not and these kind of things. But they drill a hole in the concrete, they let that sit and, uh, and uh, acclimate, and then they put uh, probes in and they measure the relative humidity in the concrete slab itself. And the reason why this test is uh, is so good is when it's independent of the environment. You, you, you're not changing moisture vapor drive or the relative humidity in the slab by changing the atmosphere in the room. The only thing that changes the relative humidity in the slab is the atmosphere in the room and time. 
which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I can find out now what the relative humidity is in that slab. And if it's 80% or 90% and I put a non-breathable coating over the top, it's always going to be 80 to 90%. But if for some reason uh, circumstances result in a moisture drive scenario, I have a much higher potential for moisture drive and failures if I have a high relative humidity. I can measure um, usually so I can use a calcium chloride test and I can measure a, a, a slab and I may not get an excess of three pounds per thousand square foot of moisture drive depending on the atmosphere in the room or in that little bubble that I'm that I'm putting on the slab. But even though I'm not getting that three pounds per thousand square foot, I may have relative humidity levels that are far above what the manufacturer's recommendations are because in the future that moisture could create an issue for us with a with a, a moisture sensitive coating so i think that this is the the test method that uh, that most manufacturers are moving towards if you look at a lot of manufacturers these days they have both listed they have the uh, the vape the, the calcium chloride test and this test listed um i think that uh, in the in the future we're probably going to see more and more of this test here Now, another thing I talked about a minute ago that affects uh, coatings and adhesives and things like that is pH level in the concrete. Uh, concrete is naturally high in pH and the water, uh, when it's moist, can, can increase that pH. So there's two tests that are run for that. And uh, they're both fairly simple tests uh, that when which they're using strips or uh, phenolphthalein or something along that line, and they're they're basing it off of a color that they see in the in the in the test in the in the solution at the surface. But um, typically, pH limits that manufacturers of coatings are going to be looking for are you know maximum of nine to ten, and that's about the lowest you're going to be able to get concrete really it's it's, it's, much, it's very difficult to get it much lower than uh than a ph of a nine but um in that case uh you know you need to be actually looking at the particular product and what their recommendations are for for ph and then as far as test frequency goes this is a very simple test to run it's not very expensive and it's typically run right alongside either the relative humidity test or the uh the calcium chloride test. When well, anytime we're running these tests, uh, it's very important to to consider the the environment that we're that we're testing in because that can change things. That's particularly with the moisture vapor drive tests. So we want to have the floor or the room under normal operating conditions. We'd like to have it, you know, and and have it that way for a given period of time before we actually run the test. Don't, don't turn the heat up to you know, uh, 70 degrees tonight and then come back and run the test tomorrow morning. You know, we want that slab to acclimate to those, to those conditions in the room. Uh, we're typically looking for temperatures of 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We're looking for relative humidities in the room of 60% uh, uh, for a minimum of 48 hours before we actually come in and run those tests. And then we also want to make sure that the floor is prepped in a manner that it's going to be prepped prior to application of a coating or an adhesive. And the reason is, is because uh, the, 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 the levels of vapor drive will change when we actually do something like shot blast the floor. Again, you remove that top layer and you've got to let that slab acclimate. You've got to let the moisture want to, will want to, to equate, equilibrate itself um, throughout the slab. So when you pull the surface off the slab, you've got to let it equilibrate. So we talked about the problems that moisture can create in concrete. And we talked about how to determine what the uh, moisture levels are in the concrete to help prevent some of those problems. Now, where does the water in the concrete come from? Well, there's a certain amount of water in the concrete mixture itself. We'll talk about that. 
a lot of times there's topical exposure, meaning the slab's been poured, but then water's, the, you know, the slab's exposed to water afterwards. We'll talk about that. And then there's water that enters the con uh, concrete slab on grade from below. So let's talk about uh, the water in concrete. A lot of you that seen my presentations before have seen this slide before, but um, for those that haven't, concrete is basically just a, a mixture of cement, sand, water, and stone. And the, the cement, the sand, and the water react and form a paste that glues all the rocks together. The most important thing that I can tell anyone about concrete is in a given yard of concrete, the water that's in that concrete, about half of that is going to evaporate or go away. When I pour a yard of concrete, half of the water that's in there is in there just to hydrate the cement and create that reaction. But if I don't have enough water in there, I can't get it down the chute of the truck and I can't get it placed and I can't get it finished. So half of the water in the concrete is there for what's called convenience. And that half of the water does not get bound up in chemical reaction and is subject to bleed and evaporation are basically the ways that it leaves the concrete. So if I look at a given yard of concrete, let's say this is a 4,000 PSI mix, which is typically going to have about 275 pounds of water in. At 275 pounds of water, half of that water, about 138 pounds, is there for convenience, and that needs to leave the concrete, or will leave the concrete, if we let it. Figure that a four-inch slab takes about 81 square foot per cubic yard of concrete. So if I've got a 5,000 square foot slab, that's about 62 cubic yards of concrete. 62 cubic yards times 138 pounds of water. That means I've got 8,500 pounds of water or 1,000 gallons of water that needs to evaporate out of a 5,000 square foot floor. So you start to get the idea, get an idea of how much moisture is in there and how much needs to leave. And uh, a great deal of the problems that we see today are due to the fact that the uh, coatings and the, 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 the moisture sensitive adhesives and things like that are put on the slabs before that moisture can escape. Now, compound that with water that may be added to the slab after it's been poured. Maybe they uh, water cure it, they pond it, or maybe the slab like this one shown here is poured outdoors and it gets rained on. All of these things, once we re-wet the slab, we basically restart the drying clock. This is a, a, a slide that shows, um, you know, initial drying and the time that it takes. So uh, this is a vapor emission rate on the left there in pounds per thousand. It shows you that three pound limit. So we're looking at for this slab uh, under normal conditions, we're looking at, you know, 50 some days before it's going to reach uh, the three pounds per thousand square foot of, of water vapor or moisture vapor drive that we want. However, all we've got to do is re-wet it and it starts all over again. That time does. Um, second re-wetting is, is, is not as dramatic, but um, again, anything that, that introduces moisture to the slab, whether it be cleaning operations, rainwater, um, curing operations, those kind of things, anything that introduces moisture to that concrete once it's been poured are going to slow down significantly the drying time that's required to, to reach the levels that we need so that we can put our flooring down. Now, another source of water in concrete slabs, we talked about the you know the water that's in the concrete itself when it's mixed. Another source is groundwater, water that's you know we're talking about slabs on grade here, so we're talking about water or slabs on metal deck even. Well, slabs on grade, let's talk about those. Uh, slabs on grade here, so and water that's coming up through the slab uh, that the, the concrete's being exposed to from below, and those sources can be hydrostatic pressure, 
maybe uh, we're below the water level, uh, capillary action and vapor diffusion, and we'll, we'll discuss those. So when I look at uh, capillary absorption, uh, it's defined as movement that takes place of water due to, um, uh, and basically it's due to uh, surface tension in the pores. And it's, it's like a wicking of, of actual water into the concrete. So certainly I can set a, a, a concrete block down in a tray of water and it's difficult to see, but that water level is right about there. And you can see the dampness up into the concrete where the water has actually worked against gravity and been sucked up into the concrete due to the surface tension in the capillaries and pores. So there's wicking or capillary absorption, and then there's permeability. Permeability is water that's pushed through concrete under some type of a pressure gradient Typically, that's going to be um, hydrostatic pressure and, and those kind of things. And then finally, you've got moisture vapor transmission or vapor diffusion. Whenever I pour a slab on grade, I'm trapping moisture below it. And the reason is, is that, you know, just as we've learned in science class when we were in high school, Water vapor is constantly coming out of the ground. And that water vapor obviously uh, it goes up into the air, it condensates and becomes clouds, and then it rains and it, the cycle starts all over again. So when I pour a slab on grade, in this case, we've got uh, the darker area is my soil or grade, uh, then I've got fill, which is a light tan area. And then I pour that slab over it, moisture vapor doesn't stop migrating upwards. It's, it's migrating upwards because it's trying to, again, uh, equilibrate between the pressures. So you've got 100% relative humidity, or you've got high pressure below the slab, and you've got low pressure above the slab. And vapor wanting to travel from the high pressure area to the low pressure area so that it can be going to equilibrium. That creates our moisture drive or vapor drive. So when I put a slab over the top of it and trap that, I end up with 100% relative humidity underneath the slab. And that doesn't matter whether that slab is in Iowa, Minnesota, New Mexico, or the Sahara Desert. Every slab that's poured is going to have, at some point, 100% relative humidity below it because moisture is always moving out of the earth into the air. There may be a little amount, very little amount of moisture in, um, in New Mexico, uh, but in, uh, in Minnesota, it's gonna be a fairly high degree of moisture. So either way, we end up with 100% relative humidity underneath the slab. And if I don't have anything blocking this, this low pressure here creates a drive in which the moisture wants to move up through the slab and emit as vapor. Now, this is different than hydraulic or hydrostatic pressure. A lot of times people will bust open a, a blister and water will be in that blister and they'll say, this is hydrostatic pressure. That's not hydrostatic pressure, it's osmotic pressure. In order for hydrostatic pressure to actually occur, the slab level would have to be below the level of the water so that I've got a, a given degree of head pressure that's pushing it upwards. So there's a difference between moisture vapor transmission and hydra hydraulic heads or, or hydrostatic pressure. So we know now where the water comes from in the concrete and, what, and, and how it presents its problems for us. How do we prevent it? We're gonna talk about proper vapor barriers, fast drying concrete mixes, curing materials, 
controlled environments, popular proper moisture testing, and surface applied moisture mitigation coatings. Those are ways we can prevent it. A good rule of thumb when you're talking about vapor pressure, waterproof is not always vapor proof. However, vapor proof is always waterproof. And the reason for this is a water, a liquid water molecule is much larger than a vapor molecule. So I can make something that's waterproof. Maybe Gore-Tex might be a good example of this. I can make something that's waterproof that will stop a liquid water molecule from coming through. But the screen or whatever that's doing that is not dense enough that it will stop a vapor molecule from coming through. However, if something is vapor proof, if it's tight enough to stop a vapor molecule from coming through, it's certainly tight enough to stop a water molecule, a liquid water molecule from coming through. So just because somebody has a coating out there that they say is waterproof, it does not mean it's going to help you with vapor transmission. Vapor barriers are the first thing we can talk about. These are excellent ways of preventing moisture issues in our slabs. And uh, they do so by placing that vapor barrier <clears throat> directly beneath the concrete slab. And these vapor barriers, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of discussion on vapor barriers and the technologies they've been around for, for quite a while. And there are some excellent ones on the market. And ASTM has done a very good job of, of dictating uh, what, what is a vapor barrier and what isn't and that kind of thing. Um, however, if one thing that I will talk about is there's been a change over the years as to where that vapor barrier should be placed. And it, many people will remember that at one point, the vapor barrier was placed and then they placed a sand bed over the top of it and then they poured the concrete on top of that sand bed. The reason why <clears throat> that changed, if you think about it, is if I have a puncture in my vapor barrier below a sand bed, <clears throat> lose my voice. If I have a puncture in my vapor barrier below my sand bed, when the moisture travels up through that puncture and gets into that sand, <clears throat> it can go anywhere. And the sand is not densely enough packed that it prevents lateral migration of moisture vapor. So if I have several punctures there, the moisture can get into that sand and it can accumulate to the point where it becomes a serious problem over time. Whereas if the moisture vapor barrier or the vapor barrier is directly below the slab and I have a puncture in it, the slab is only exposed to the moisture in that one little area. In this scenario, the slab could be subject to moisture across many square foot as the moisture builds up in that sand layer. So that's the reason why uh, they made that change. And, uh, and that's the, the best way to do it is to put the vapor barrier directly beneath the slab. Now we can address the water that's in the concrete by, by creating basically faster drying concrete. And how do we do that? Well, we can lower the water cement ratio in the concrete. And we can maximize the top size aggregate in the concrete. One, by lowering the water cement ratio in the concrete, we are in, in essence adding more cement to the concrete that's going to react and bind up that water in, in chemical reactions so that it doesn't want to evaporate. When I talk about maximizing the top size aggregate, anyone that sat through one of my mixed design presentations of, will know that, you know, um, the water that's in a given yard of concrete is not dictated by the water cement ratio. It's dictated by the aggregate that's in the concrete. We need to have enough water in the mix to, to coat the actual stone. And Larger aggregate, a given volume of larger aggregate, has a smaller surface area of stone than the same given volume of a smaller aggregate. 
basically, you know, if I use a one and a half inch aggregate versus a three quarter inch aggregate, there's significantly less surface area to coat with that one and a half inch aggregate than there is with the three quarter inch aggregate, which means I can have less water in my mix with a one and a half inch aggregate. So we do, when we do this, we're adding less water to the concrete to begin with. We're lowering the water cement ratio, and that is uh, adding more cement to the mix, which is reacting again and in, in, in binding up that water. The other thing that happens is, you know, when we do these things, we can also add then water reducing admixtures, which further reduce the amount of water that has to go into the concrete and helps us uh, get faster drying concrete. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, other admixtures out there as well. So this table here basically is showing us that the water cement ratio has a fairly dramatic effect on the drying time of a four inch concrete slab to reach three pounds per thousand square foot. And um, interestingly enough, notice uh, this column here, the middle column where it says exposed to vapor. So if I don't have a vapor barrier beneath that slab and that slab is you know, just sitting on the ground, moisture vapor will delay the actual drying time of that slab. So a lot of people say, well, the slab's not drying out because we're putting a, uh, a vapor barrier on it. It's actually drying a little bit quicker if you put a vapor barrier underneath it. If it's in contact with water, it extends it even more. But it, over here on the left, we can see the water cement ratio. And that's telling us that you know, at a 0.4 water cement ratio, we're getting about the optimal results as far as drying time. Testing's also shown us that um, slab thickness has uh, no real given, uh, it, it has an effect on the moisture vapor emission rate or the moisture vapor transmission, but it doesn't have much effect on the relative humidity. So when I'm dealing with relative humidity, the thicker the slab, the longer it's going to take to get the relative humidity to where we want it to be. But a good rule of thumb is with normal concrete, it takes about 30 days per inch of concrete thickness in a controlled environment for it to reach the levels that it needs to reach to apply flooring to it. So if I've got a moisture sensitive flooring, so if I've got a, a four inch slab, I'm looking at 90 to 120 days before I can come in and actually put my coatings on it, unless I do something to uh, shorten that time frame whether that be faster drying concrete or um, something along those lines. What about water repellent admixtures? There's a lot of water repellent admixtures on the market. Uh, I have water repellent admixtures, but I, I sometimes see these mistakenly being uh, substituted for uh, or, or put in to, to eliminate moisture drive or to um, to allow people to put uh, uh, moisture sensitive flooring supposedly on the floor sooner. These don't do anything for the drying time of the concrete. Most of these are soaps, fatty acids, uh, vegetable oils, things like that, that basically um, you put it in the concrete and it reduces the capillary absorption of the concrete, but it doesn't do anything for the water that's in the concrete. Uh, and, it, and it certainly doesn't do anything for hydrostatic pressure, or not hydrostatic, it doesn't do anything for hydrostatic pressure, no, and it doesn't do anything for vapor pressure either. So the way these work is they work by these, these are hydrophobic materials, they work by lining the capillaries and pores of the concrete so that when they actually, um, uh, water hits it, it wants to beat up on the surface, but if you put any pressure on that water, it'll push it right on through. So uh, it, it, it stops, it, it beads up a liquid water molecule, but it doesn't do anything for, for stopping uh, moisture vapor transmission. And that is the same for the polymer admixtures that are on the market. Uh, they will reduce the concrete permeability to liquid water, but they don't do anything for us as far as um, stopping moisture vapor transmission. There's finely divided solids, which these are 
basically fines in the form of either bentonite, uh, powders, clay, lime, silicates, and colloidal silicates, which I hear a lot about these days. What these do is they react in the concrete to form more cement paste, which helps to uh, reduce the number of capillaries and pores that are in the concrete. However, again, uh, there's, there's no significant proof that they actually stop moisture vapor transmission from going through the concrete. And then finally, there's crystalline waterproofing admixtures. Again, these are actually waterproof. The ones I've been talking to up until now won't work even under hydrostatic pressure. Crystalline admixtures create a crystalline growth in the capillaries and pores that, that stops water from, penet from, from permeating through the concrete. Again, no, they're breathable, meaning they allow vapor, vapor transmission. So again, they're not gonna do anything for us as far as moisture vapor transmission. Curing, when we come to curing the concrete, what we wanna do typically is gonna be like a seven day polycure. It's important that the concrete be cured. It's, it's critical that the concrete be cured. But once it's cured for seven days, we wanna get that poly off of there and let it start drying out. We don't wanna add water to the concrete surface to cure it. That only extends the drying time. And we don't wanna use curing compounds. Um, you know, if we add water, obviously we're just extending the drying time, but if we add a curing compound, they actually slow the drying process. Curing compounds allow moisture vapor to breathe out of the concrete, but at a much slower rate. So they don't do us a whole lot of good as far as uh, um, drying the concrete out. They're actually working against us. So typically what we don't want to do when we are curing a slab or we want to get on it early is to, to, to polycure it. So we've done all these things or supposedly done all these things, but then uh, our guy comes out with the flooring down, he tests it, and it shows that the floor is in excess of the limits that they need. It, it's, uh, the relative humidity is too high, or the, uh, the moisture vapor transmission is too high. So what can be done? At this point, the, the one proven thing out there is to apply a surface applied moisture mitigation coating. These are typically epoxy coatings that are designed to penetrate and bond much better than than even your standard epoxy coatings are, that they are uh, very low in perm rating or, not, or basically vapor proof. They won't let vapor pass through. So if, if you've got that in place, now there is no more moisture vapor transmission up through the slab that can result in the problems that we've been talking about. ASTM F3010 came out with a designation for these in 2018 for two component, two component resin-based membrane forming moisture mitigation systems for under resilient floor coverings. And uh, this is the governing piece. It's a great piece. Um, if I'm looking at using some type of a surface applied moisture mitigation system, this is the, the ASTM that I should be looking to. It requires one, that it be membrane forming. It has to form a membrane on the surface to stop the vapor from passing through. It gives a permeance of no greater than 0.1 grains per hour per square foot per inch of hygrometer. Um, but basically that's a, a perm rating there that's very, very low. It's, it's actually quantifying how much vapor is allowed to pass through that coating. And it calls for a minimum 200 PSI tensile strength of the concrete itself. Um, the reason being that if I don't have that 200 PSI tensile strength of the concrete and I put a coating on there that wants to hold the vapor in and it's bonded real well to the concrete, it'll pull the concrete apart. So we want to actually test the concrete and make sure that the tensile strength of the concrete is there. The systems not included in this ASTM designation are uh, chemically reactive constituents to form a gel or crystalline substance, substance within the concrete. So any of your silicates or things like that that want to penetrate in and supposedly react and uh, form something in the pores of the concrete, they do not constitute a, a, a vapor mitigation coating. Um, pen again, penetrating compounds that do not form a continuous membrane. That's, they, they say this over and over again. And then water-based membrane forming systems. You saw that it's called for a two component system. The reason is, is most two component systems, the way they react and form a film is they cross-link, which forms a much, much tighter film. 
water-based membrane forming systems that aren't two component, what they do is they coalesce, which forms a much more open film. And that film will typically allow more moisture vapor to transmit through it. So when we are applying these moisture vapor transmission systems, you've got the concrete, and then you apply the moisture vapor transmission system directly to the concrete. And then you can come back if you're doing a resinous floor coating and you can put that liquid applied resinous floor coating directly over the top of that moisture vapor transmission system. If I'm going to actually be putting down something like carpet or tile or anything with an adhesive that typically bonds to concrete, the way I do that is I put down the moisture vapor transmission system. And then I put down an epoxy primer with this that's sand seeded, which we'll show, I'll show you in a second. And then I follow that with a cement underlayment, usually, you know, let's say a quarter inch to a half inch of cement underlayment. And now I've got a cementitious surface without moisture vapor drive coming up through it that the carpet and tile adhesive is designed to bond to. So what I'm talking about here is they're putting down an epoxy primer over the top of the moisture vapor transmission coating. They're sanding it to refusal. They come back and they remove all the excess sand. And now you've got this nice mineral surface that I can put my underlayment over and it bonds to that. The underlayment bonds to that. And now once I've got that underlayment, now I've got now a cementitious system that they can come in and put that tile adhesive down over. When we're dealing with moisture vapor transmission systems, we wanna deal with the cracks and the joints in the floor because those are places where moisture can come up through the concrete. Typically what we do is we come in and we fill those joints or cracks with the actual moisture vapor transmission coating, detail it ahead of time, and then we apply it over the top and we got basically a seamless moisture transmission mitigating coating over the surface and then we can apply our flooring to it. In cases where we've got joints that want to move, such as isolation joints or maybe even moving cracks, in those cases, those have to be transferred up through the system. The system can move, but it can't move that much. So what we end up doing is we transfer that up. In this case, we've got a penetration through the slab. And we actually put in a elastomeric sealant around the joint or in the joint to actually seal it where it's coming up through. So. This is just one of our uh, one of our, our moisture mitigating coating systems. You can see its resistance is up to 25 pounds per thousand square foot, whereas you know typically your limit is is three pounds in uh, in a concrete surface for um, most of your moisture sensitive flooring. We can apply this material if moisture levels are as high as 25 pounds per thousand square foot. We can apply it to concrete with a relative humidity of a of 100%. And at, at that point, then it stops all moisture from coming up through the concrete slab. It's resistant to alkalinity above the pH of 14. So if I've got something that's pH sensitive, this again is working as a barrier between that pH sensitive coating and that high pH concrete. Okay, that concludes the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? All right, great. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, helpful information. We do have questions uh, that have come through. Uh, as we are going through these, you can continue to submit questions or comments as they come up. Uh, let's see here. Um, when slabs are poured directly on vapor barriers and not have some aggregate or something allowing air movement, so moisture below the slab can evaporate or move away from the slab. Uh, you have moisture problems on the surface manifesting itself in mastic failures. Well, it doesn't sound like a question. Um... Nope, yeah, that's a statement. <laughs> You had to get there and read it. It was a long one. So, so the 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 the, the modern thought on this, not to say that this thought isn't modern, but the the uh, the governing thought at the American Concrete Institute 
is that if you've got that sand layer below the, uh, let's go back to that here. So if I've got that sand layer below the slab and that the water from the concrete, let's say, goes into this sand layer immediately after you're, you've poured the concrete, is I think what he's implying that the, that the concrete can dry because the moisture is moving down into the slab, uh, down into the uh, um, uh, sand. If I've got a vapor barrier below that sand, there's nowhere for that moisture to go. You still got moisture there and it has to leave. And the only way it can leave is up through the concrete. It's, it, 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 it can't evaporate. Even if it moves laterally, there's no, there's no place for it to move. So the thought is that by having a saturated sand layer underneath here, it takes that much longer for the slab to dry out because you've now got basically 100% relative humidity again at the base of the slab. By placing the vapor barrier directly beneath the, uh, the slab, the water can only go up. It can't go into the sand, it can't saturate the sand, and it does end up moving up and out of the slab quicker than if you had the sand there. Not to mention the fact that what ends up happening is again, if I've got a puncture in the vapor barrier, I can get saturated sand again underneath the concrete. And I can get saturated sand that covers a, a vast amount of area versus if there was a puncture just in the vapor barrier directly beneath the, the slab. If I have a you know a half inch cut in the in the vapor barrier here beneath the slab, the amount of moisture that can get up through there into the concrete is very limited. If I've got it here at the actual below the sand, the amount of moisture that can get it in there is as much as that sand can take. And we know that because of the interstitial spacing between the uh, in the sand, the vapor and moisture can migrate laterally through the sand. So that's the that's the thought. Uh, that uh, that ACI has regarding that. And next question. Yep. the The next question. I'm actually going to send you Matt um, into the chat box for yourself. Um, it's more of a kind of a debated topic, which I believe follows along the same lines of the conversation that you just reviewed. Um, I'll let you kind of read through that if you do see that, uh, Matt, in your own private chat box. Um, I did send that over to you. I'll let you read that. I will um, let you take a moment to read that and, and summarize it back uh, to the team. Your expertise is going to be better um than than me trying to summarize that one well you're trying to put you're, you're providing a written answer and you're asking me to look at the written answer um that, that was the yeah that was the uh question that was a, a kind of a topic a debated topic from um a guest um and i had just i just put it in the in your private chat box matt if you have access to that yeah okay okay you the one at 12 31 p.m Yes. Okay. Changing the location of the barrier doesn't help the problem of slab hydration if curing water is trapped against the bottom of the slab by the vapor barrier. Two issues happen. The curing conditions of the surface of the, and the bottom of the slab are different and thus cure at different rates. This can create curling issues. Um, the challenge of urgency to occupy the slab drives the curing compound or membrane, et cetera, at the surface, even if trying to control cracking, which traps the moisture in the slab. Um, I'm still trying to kind of understand, um, let's see, the curing conditions of the surface and the bottom of the slab are different. He's referring to curling. Um, 
Yeah, Next and we please. do have some other questions. We have some other questions that talk about, um, you know, that they've experienced slab curl issues with vapor barrier directly below slab. Could you comment on this? So there are quite a few questions as it relates to um, slab curling. Yeah, yeah. So again, I've seen studies that go back and forth. Um, I, I've seen studies that say that actually having the vapor barrier, and I've talked to some very knowledgeable engineers like Scott Tarr and Peter Craig on this, who do deal in this every day. Um, they'll tell you that having the vapor barrier be directly beneath the slab actually results in less curling than having it below the sand layer. Keep in mind that you know it's differential cure that causes our problems in our slabs. So uh, if it's curing differently on the bottom than it is on the top, we can have curling or warping of the slab. And curling goes both ways. The slab doesn't necessarily have to be drying more on the top than on the bottom for it to curl. It can be drying more on the bottom than it is on the top for it to curl. So when you start talking, I think that the if you were to talk to someone like Scott Tarr, what he would tell you is that the moisture can only go up through the concrete. And because it can only go up through the concrete, we tend to have less of a chance of it drying quicker at the surface because of the fact that it's coming from below and keeping that wet. If we put the sand below it, my understanding is what can happen is you get, it's a dry quicker at the bottom of the concrete than it does at the top because we have a curing compound and something like that. And you end up with warping of the slab or curling of the slab. So the, the thought there on curling and the studies that the, the most recent studies are showing that the, uh, the vapor barrier actually is not, uh, is not cre creating excessive curling. And if any, in anything, it's actually reducing the curling. Now that's up for debate um, and has been up for debate for a very long time. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I tend to go with, you know, the way that the, the, the Institute is going now, but um, I wouldn't argue too hard with somebody about it. Uh, but what I would say is that, you know, when we start talking about actually putting moisture sensitive flooring down on a, on a slab, um, then having that vapor barrier there is critical. Uh, All point, right. number two, point number two oh. is that the, the challenge of urgency to occupy the slab drives a curing compound or membrane, et cetera, at the surface. Um, even if trying to control cracking, which traps the moisture in the slab. So now you have a vapor barrier on the bottom of the slab and a coating, even if breathable on the surface. Water has a harder time exiting the slab during curing. Yeah, I, I did say that, yeah, that we, we, um, we need to watch uh, putting down some type of a curing compound in these cases, because what it's doing is slowing the rate of, uh, of water escaping from the slab. Uh, we can put down poly for seven days and pull that poly and allow it to, you know, uh, to start drying. Hopefully we've got the room up and running as far as HVAC and things like that. I hope that answers the question. All right, if not, we can, uh, not, you know, you, you can you can respond back. Yeah, we, we can, you know, you guys are gonna get a copy of this, so we'll yeah. respond back, but we'll keep going. We have quite a few questions um, that are coming in. Great questions. Um, using your basement wet cardboard box bottom example, how would you solve this problem? Well, the only, uh, I can tell you how I solved it in my basement. Um, you know, I wanted to put flooring down, uh, but, when I looked at the different types of flooring you could put down there, um, they're all most of them are susceptible to to moisture vapor issues. If I were to put carpet down there, I would probably end up with some type of mold or mildew in the pad, and it would smell bad. Um, if I tried to put some type of a, um, you know epoxy coating or or something like that down there, I would have had issues as well. Um, I would have needed to put down a moisture vapor transmission type coating, which 
uh, Euclid pays me, but they don't pay me well enough to afford it. So I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, you know, what I ended up doing was putting down ceramic tile because it's a cementitious system and uh, the adhesive is really not affected by moisture. Um, now I can tell you that uh, I put down the, the cementitious tile or the, the uh, ceramic tile and uh, I still do have um, efflorescence at a lot of my mortar joints, which I have to go back through periodically and clean because as vapor comes up through the slab, it drags with it uh, minerals and salts that that uh, that dry on those mortar joints or those grout joints in the form of uh, of efflorescence. But typically, if you if you've got that type of a moisture drive issue, the only way to really solve that issue is to uh, if you want to put moisture sensitive flooring down, is to put down a uh, uh, a moisture mitigating coating like the one that I, I, I showed you there at the end of the presentation. Uh, otherwise, you can put down things like breathable sealers and, and, and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, you could put an acrylic sealer down there. I wouldn't want to put a colored one, but a clear acrylic sealer will breathe. You know, we put acry clear acrylic sealers down over concrete that's, you know, just been poured hours ago and they, 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 allow, they, they don't get pushed off by the moisture. But, so you could seal that with an acrylic sealer, but um, and it might slow that that rate down a little bit, but it's a, it's a difficult problem to address if you've got it. All right. Um, after a number of years of use in vehicle garages for DOT organizations in winter climates, we have seen concrete surfaces begin spalling and pitting. Is this related to the initial mix treatment? more or the use of salt-based water brines and snow spilling onto the floor in the heated garage over time. Typically what you're seeing there is a couple of different things, but uh, one, if you've, if you've got a garage where you're, you don't have a, real, a controlled environment and the temperatures are dropping below freezing in there, then freeze thaw will definitely cause that surface to scale. The other thing that happens often when you're dealing with chlorides and brines and things like that is the wetting and drying of the chlorides itself in the concrete can be expansive. And over time, that can cause spalling or chipping at the concrete surface. The only time I, I, I rarely see it be an issue with the aggregate, and if it is an aggregate issue, it's, it becomes pretty, it's pretty easy to, to pick out. Um, if it's an aggregate issue, typically what I'll see is uh, a, a pop in the concrete and then a, like a little dark piece of aggregate in there that's soft, almost like a clay that I can chip away with like a car key even. Um, the, so that's something like chert or clay that might have been in the concrete. And uh, usually, you know, there, there's there's limits to the, to the allowable amount of those soft aggregates in concrete, but those can absorb water and, and then when they freeze, they can expand and, and cause issues. But um, I, I've tend to think that in a garage like that, which you're probably seeing over time, is where they're driving the trucks in and the chlorides just dripping down onto the concrete and penetrating in and then drying and, and crystallizing and then wetting and drying and wetting and drying. And that, that, can, that can certainly cause issues. All okay. right. Um, Yep, we've got some more here. Um, yep. There's a request to go back to the slide with layers on top of MVT. Okay. And then as it re as you're getting there, I will um, kind of tie a couple of questions together, I think. Um, what are some of the compatibility issues with the MVT system and the floor finish system? And, do the MVT systems have to be replaced or touched up when the flooring is removed and replaced with something new? Okay, so in this particular case, what we're doing here is, this is our final floor finish material. This is our, the top one, obviously, is our carpet, let's say. And um, the moisture vapor transmission system is going down over the concrete. And then you wanna use, Typically, you want the underlayment that you're going to use, the cementitious underlayment and the, and the epoxy primer to be by the same manufacturer as the moisture vapor transmission system. So they can guarantee the compatibility between the primer and the moisture vapor transmission system. 
Then the underlayment obviously is by the same manufacturer, so he can guarantee the compatibility between the cement underlayment and the sand seed of the epoxy primer. Once we get that surface down there, now we have a cementitious floor that our carpet and tile adhesive can adhere to. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, if not, we'll let you. Um, like I said, you'll have a, you'll have, you'll, you'll know who to follow up with um, after after the call today, and you yeah. can reach out to them directly. I know, I know it's. If I haven't answered anybody's questions sufficiently, please feel free to call me. I'm, you know, just sitting here in my home office. I'm not traveling, so I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about any of these questions. Awesome. Um, we've got a few more here. Um, again, a couple of these I'm going to tie together. Um, obviously, this is the, you know, we've kind of concluded the AIA portion of the presentation. There is a uh, product specific question, uh, but we did get another, a couple of questions about radon mitigation. Will the Dural um, Aquatite work for radon mitigation? And along that line, does a layer of aggregate for radon removal benefit reduction of moisture? Mm. Kind of getting a little beyond my purview when we're talking about radon. Um, I would have to check and see what our data sheets, if it even mentions radon gas, um, which I can do pretty quickly here. Um, as far as the aggregate goes, uh, I, again, aggregate doesn't do a real good job of of diffusing or stopping moisture vapor transmission. Remember that moisture vapor is traveling up through the soil, which is all aggregate, right? So um, you know, aggregate doesn't really do much for us as far as uh, uh, moisture vapor transmission. I'm not sure what it does for us as far as radon goes, because I am not a, uh, uh, by any means, a uh, expert on, on radon. Uh, let's see here, let me take a look at our coding real quick. If it says anything. They're asking all these great questions because of all your great credentials, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to cut that list down. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think we mentioned, I, we don't mention radon. I'd have to ask some of our people about it. Um, I, I, I can't really speak to radon intelligently at this point. Okay, um, we're, we've got two more questions here, um, and then uh, we'll we'll start to wrap up. And again, if you guys have some more, and if we didn't get to your question or Mark um, hasn't answered it, Mark and um, his team do receive a full copy of all of these questions today, whether they've been answered or not. And uh, Mark will definitely be following up with with you all one-on-one um, -on -one, um, should that be needed. So. Um, here's a couple questions. Are you seeing any issues with slabs on frost-free footings? On frost-free footings? Yes. I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. Yeah, I, I apologize. No worry. Um, have you seen alligator cracking on a slab surface when cure sealer is placed at higher amount rates than manufacturer specifications? And if alligator cracking occurs, is the same method of placement acceptable that you specified? Typically, alligator cracking is, is plastic shrinkage cracking at the very surface. It's, it's high evaporation conditions at the surface itself. And those conditions can occur during concrete placement. So, um, the curing compound, a lot of times, by the time you get the curing compound on there, you've already got the craze cracking there. So um, it's, it's difficult to, um, to say whether or not the curing compound should have stopped it or something like that. But usually what, what helps the most with, uh, with craze cracking is an evaporation retarder that you actually put on the concrete during the finishing process. Just keep in mind, water starts evaporating from the concrete surface the moment it hits the ground doesn't have to have a trowel finish on it. The moment it hits the ground, water's wanting to leave, and it's leaving faster than it can react with the cement. 
So, and that's why we're doing things to try and hold the moisture in. So if I've got high evaporative conditions, a hot windy day or something like that, or even a cold windy day, um, what I wanna try and do is keep that concrete from losing water. And you can do that a couple of different ways. You can put poly on the concrete between finishing processes, or you can use an evaporation retarder, which we spray on there. Uh, it does not have any effect on the bond of coatings or things because pH burns it off in a matter of hours. But you can put that on there and that will help a lot with the, with the craze cracking that, that you're seeing. Other thing that helps a lot with craze cracking is uh, microfiber reinforcement. As in, uh, the reason for that is microfibers, what they do is they even out the bleed across the concrete surface. What ends up happening a lot of times when you look out across the slab that's bleeding quite freely, you'll see puddles of water in some places and you'll see dry spots in other places. So you're getting an uneven bleed across the surface of the slab and it's shrinking differently in those areas. You know, where you got a puddle, it's shrinking differently than it is in an area where it's dry. If I use microfibers, what they do is they tend to control the size of the capillaries that are allowing the water to bleed up out of the concrete. It gives you a more even bleed across the surface and you can reduce a lot of that, um, a lot of that issue. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Matt. I haven't seen any other new questions pop in, so uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. A uh, big thank you to Euclid for providing today's webinar. and. Uh, Matt for answering these great questions. We'd also like to thank each of you for joining today's webinar. Uh, over the course of the next few weeks, you can expect Euclid to submit your AIA credit and you will also receive your certificate of attendance. To clarify, your certificate of attendance comes with the email that will contain a copy of today's recording. Once you exit today's call, once again, you will have a survey uh, regarding today's presentation, uh, the Euclid company and CSG and Whitecap would appreciate if you would complete the survey, and we do value your feedback. On behalf of Construction Supply Group, Whitecap, and Euclid Chemical Company, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. And I've got my phone number and email up there if anyone wants to give me a call to, to discuss some of these questions that we had. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks.